Bell, Louisiana. I'm Chef John Foles welcoming you to this great state of ours. These beautiful plantation homes reflect the fascinating history of our culture and cuisine, and I'd like to share this story with you. Why not join me and some of my friends as we visit the plantation homes of our state and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Louisiana Gold and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. When Evelina Prescott's father decided to build his plantation home in the early 1800s, he knew that he had selected the perfect location. It was high up on a bluff, complete with cypress swamps and ponds, and surrounded by every variety of Louisiana trees and flowers imaginable. Evelina even kept a diary and wrote about the roses, the oleanders, and the hydrangeas that were everywhere in the garden. When Ann and Tipton Goliaths bought the home in 1985 and decided to renovate it, they knew that they would have to reconstruct Evelina's beautiful gardens and give them back to Louisiana and the world free of charge. I'm Chef John Foles. Welcome to 60 Acres of Paradise, Magnolia Ridge Plantation. This wonderful setting is indeed the perfect spot for Magnolia Ridge Plantation. It was built in the early 1830s by Judge John Moore. Here in the formal dining room, we see what was originally the dining room and the parlor. The center walls separating the two were torn down and the two fireplaces were also combined to make one larger one. Imagine being warmed by this. On the judge's desk next door is not only a drawing of himself, but also an original letter that was written in his own hand. Boy, look at that gorgeous inkwell in the background. The money shown here probably belonged to Confederate Captain Lewis Prescott, who owned the home a few years later. He achieved fame with his command of the 2nd Louisiana Cavalry during the Civil War. Today, Ann and Tipton Goliaths has restored the home to its original grandeur, complete with beautiful antiques and 60 acres of manicured gardens. Here is a garden of daylilies that's flanked by that gorgeous two or three hundred year old live oak. Just think of sitting in that little chair right there. On the opposite side of the house is the cottage garden. And this garden is filled with many, many different varieties of Louisiana flowers and shrubs. I can just think about going here and uh, grabbing a scissors and cutting one or two of these and putting it in my favorite vase on my desk. Look how gorgeous these flowers are. Here is a whole garden of Queen Anne's lace, and you might remember that this lace was always seen in bridal uh, wreaths many years ago. The plantation was a sugar plantation, and this kettle is now home to some of these beautiful water lilies. Anne's uncle, Jim Taylor, serves as the master gardener along with his wife, Colleen. They came here a couple of years ago and put in all of the gardens. Here he's showing me one of these thornless roses. This, in fact, is the Seven Sisters Rose, and he says that it's original to the house, that that bush was probably planted when the house was built. The rose starts off pink, but then at some point in time, it becomes white. This right here is the parrot lily, and that parrot lily is also known as the outhouse lily because it sits right next to the outhouse in most cases. But naturally, it's the day lilies that people come here to see. And the sad thing about a day lily is even though how beautiful, you can see how beautiful they are, they only last one day, and thus the name day lilies. After that, they just kind of die away, so you have to grab them quickly. The uh, property is uh, 60 acres, and of course there's lakes that's completely stocked with all varieties of fish. And of course it's also accessible to the handicap because there's about three miles of blacktop trail going all the way through this wooded area. You can walk around there and see some of these antique hydrangeas like this one right here, and also some uh, antique azalea bushes. There's a lot of wonderful places here. This is all natural Louisiana landscape. This right here is a wildflower meadow, and every year these black-eyed Susans and all these other wild varieties kind of reseed themselves, and I can just imagine walking through this 
waist high in wildflowers. One of the most unusual spots on the property is the cypress swamp. This is my favorite. These cypress trees are probably about 100 years old, and the little cypress knees you see coming out of the water is where the trees get their oxygen. Now, be careful when you put your blanket out. You might set it down on one of those old turtles. There's very few restrictions here. You can come out from dawn to dusk, but don't bring any music or food. It's just paradise for the strollers. And what a place to stroll. Imagine just walking around those 60 acres in the afternoon with the breeze blowing. It's wonderful. It is paradise. And if you can imagine a couple coming from Texas, buying that home in the early uh, 1980s, and restoring it, putting in all of those gardens, and then saying, hey, y'all come out and enjoy. That's exactly what they did. And visiting with me in the kitchen just a little bit later is going to be the lady, well, at least one half of the team who did it, uh, Ann Goliath, the owner of the home, is going to come into the kitchen and visit. We're going to talk about a lot of things. While I was visiting out there, though, I did find a lot of recipes that were used at Magnolia Ridge in the early days. But one of the very interesting stories that I found about a dish that I want to prepare for you was a story about gumbo. And I'm going to make a chicken and sausage gumbo for you. And the reason I'm doing it is because I was reading a story where General Nathaniel Banks, one of the infamous generals of the Civil War, was in the area about 1862 and burst into that home late one night. And the mistress of the home, Evelina Prescott, was in the house with all of her sisters, just women there. And he walked in and demanded that his uh, of forces be fed outside. All the troops were waiting outside. And she says, fine. She turned her back on him and said, it's on the stove. Just go on in and feed yourself. And they walked up to the stove and looked down at one of these black iron pots. And what was in it? Chicken and sausage gumbo. But they had never seen this brown Roubaix soup of South Louisiana. And they looked in it and they said, Man, we'll never eat that. That'll kill us. And as they walked out of the door, she says, those Yankees will never win the war if they walk away from a good pot of gumbo. So anyway, in their honor, I'm going to make that great sausage and chicken gumbo that Evelina Prescott had on the stove many years ago. In the black iron pot here, I already have my roux. Now, you know that roux is equal parts of oil and flour. And of course, you can use any oil, but you can also make this roux without oil. You can put the flour in a saute pan and just brown it lightly on top of the stove or you can put it in an oven at about 250 degrees and just let it toast. The flour will toast nice and brown without the oil. There's also a lot of roux that's on the market today, so you can buy them in jars already. Here on my platter, I have the ingredients that she was using that night in 1862. We have some smoked sausage, and of course, there's many different varieties that you can use. And the chicken, now you see, I've already poached the chicken off, and I've deboned it, and that's kind of important today. We don't want all of those bones in the gumbo. So once all of the ingredients are cut and ready to go, then I can start my roux base, as I say. I'm going to put my trinity down into the, uh, into the pot. I'm going to add a little onions. And let me make sure that fire is way up here. I'm going to put a little celery. You know, we always like to put onions, celery, and bell pepper whenever we start anything, especially a good gumbo. And look how that roux is sizzling those vegetables. We want to wilt them quickly down into the roux. And once those go in, then, of course, I'll add a little touch of garlic. I want to make sure we have some of that good garlic flavor saute this around. There's nothing better, at least there's no better smell in the kitchen than roux with vegetable sauteing as I'm doing here. Once this starts to wilt and all of the vegetables release their juices down into that roux, now I can begin by putting in my smoked sausage. And you want to saute the sausage for uh, just a couple of minutes. This sausage is already cooked naturally, so you want to just go ahead and put all of the sausage down, and you want to cut it a little bit, too, because it'll release its flavor a lot sooner. And there's different degrees of smoke in sausage, too. You can get some very heavily smoked. You can use the andouille sausage, which is a ham in the casing. So many uh, choices when we make a chicken and sausage gumbo. But you want to put your sausage in with the seasonings. Let that saute for just a minute like this. And once that's done, then I can put about half of my chicken. The reason I'm putting half, of course, is I don't want the chicken to all fall apart in the original cooking process here, because this is going to have to cook for about 30 minutes or so. You want it to just saute and cook in that uh, roux with the stock I'm going to put in the pot. And this chicken and sausage will, will really start to flavor uh, this dish nicely. Now, I said I boiled the chicken and deboned it. Well, naturally, I kept the stock. And you can go into the grocery store and 
There's chicken bouillon cubes. There's chicken base that's uh, on the market now that's actually made with chicken meat. So you can get a lot of varieties of stock bases as well. But the best thing to do is to take the bones of the chicken once you boil it all together here and, well, put an onion, a little piece of celery, carrot, a bay leaf, peppercorns, any of those nice flavors into the pot with the chicken, boil it for about a half hour until it gets really nice and tender. And what you have is this wonderful flavored chicken stock. And you can put it right down into the roux. You can see how hot this is. Look at that boil. It's gonna really boil quickly here. And one cup of roux, I always like to tell you my formula, one cup of roux will thicken about three quarts of this liquid. I'm gonna put all of that in here and stir it around. And you can see how quickly the stock will dissolve that roux. And I guess this is the brown color in the pot that General Nathaniel Banks turned his nose up to. I tell you, I'm surprised they won the war, come to think of it, because this is a great, great pot of soup here. Now, it'll thicken quickly with the roux, so you want to continue to add just enough stock to give the gumbo a really good consistency. People will confuse the gumbo for the jambalaya in Louisiana, but the jambalaya is a rice dish, whereas the gumbo is a soup. So assuming that this would have cooked here for a couple of minutes now, I will add the rest of my chicken. I can just put all of that good chicken meat down into the pot. And then, of course, I can put salt. I want to just add a couple pinches of salt. Cracked black pepper, you want to start that flavor. Green onions, which is always the finish to the soup. Green onions and a touch of parsley. And for spice, I want to put a little bit of that Louisiana pepper sauce down into it, and that'll spice it up. I'll put this on a real low simmer, and I would allow this to cook for about another 35, 40 minutes, and it'll be a really great soup. And when Ann comes out into the kitchen, she and I are gonna, let me cut this fire on here, she and I are gonna test this gumbo to see what she thinks about it. Really, really nice dish. Now, my next dish I wanna do for you is also a dish that was done at Magnolia Ridge Plantation. I don't know of any generals who turn their nose up to it, but this is a potato and bacon beignet. Now, you know the beignets from New Orleans are the little fritters that's made like a donut, and we just fry them for a couple of minutes. Well, to make my potato and bacon beignets, I'm gonna begin with all of these nice seasonings here. Take a look at my little platter. I have bacon, and I've already browned the bacon until it's nice and crispy. I've got some finely minced onions because you want them very fine to go into the little beignet. We've got parsley, some nutmeg, which is gonna flavor it, cheese, garlic, green onions, and of course some eggs. But the great thing about the beignets is that you can put anything into this recipe that you want. I could put smoked sausage in it if I wanted to. Now in this bowl here, I've baked off about eight potatoes. You see, I've just got the potatoes until they're nice and tender like this, and then I could mash the potatoes with an assortment of things. Of course, you know, up north, we like to rice the potato. You can put the potatoes in the ricer when they're nice and warm and run them through here, and they'll come out really nice and soft, nice and mashed. Cajuns would go out into the swampland and just carve it. You see, they just go out and take a little piece of wood, cypress, carve a potato mash, and of course, they could use a lot of things. I'm sure they could straighten out the kids with this thing. Or modern day, we can just kind of mash the potatoes in the bowl like this with a masher and just get them all nice and mashed. These are baked until they're good and tender. You can do this the day before, by the way. And once that's done, then I can begin my seasonings. I'll put in my parsley. I'll put in all of this nice bacon here, get all that bacon. That'll flavor. Of course, the bacon will continue to season it as the beignet is cooked. I'll put some garlic into it, a little bit of these green onions, and of course, the nutmeg. I'll just sprinkle a little bit of that nutmeg. Nutmeg flavors white sauces, so you know that they would re that it really flavor these beignets. And then some nice cheese. This is a sharp cheddar cheese. You can put some jack or one of those really spicy cheese. And then one egg down into it like this. Now I'm gonna grab a spoon here and just mix it all up. You want to mix all of the ingredients, and of course you have to spice it. So you'd want to put salt and pepper and all of those good things as I'm gonna do now. A little pinch of salt, a little pinch of black pepper and get it all mixed up. And then naturally you would roll this into a little patty or a little boulette as we say in French. And the way you do it is just grab, grab a 
baseball or I guess it's about a baseball, I guess. Just pat it like, just like this. The egg will hold it all together. And I have some already made, so I'll move this out of the way. And I have to bread them. So what I'm going to do here is to take my little fritters. There's a lot of steps here, but it's worth every bit of it. Once you take your little fritter like this, you want to dip it into an egg wash, which is equal parts of egg and milk and a little water, and then, of course, flour and breadcrumbs. And those fl the flour and breadcrumbs are already seasoned. And I'll put just a couple of them here so you can get the idea of how we do them. Bread them nicely so that the breading holds them all together in the frying pan, and then we can saute them. And I'll show you how that's done. Let me get this uh, egg off of my hands here. I want to wash all of that off. You want to uh, coat them really well in the uh, flour breadcrumb mixture because in sauteing, that's what's going to make them nice and crispy on the outside, really a nice uh, coating on the outside. I'll put a little bit of this oil into my skillet and then my fritters. Take a look at this. That skillet's going to be real nice and hot. And I can put the fritters right down in there like this, the little beignets as we call them. And I would allow this to fry and, of course, turn them over once or twice to make sure that they get really nice and brown on all sides. And I have a platter of them that's already done that I want you to take a look at. So I'm going to move this off of the fire and take a look at this. You've got to take a look at this great big platter of the beignets. How does that look? And, of course, you see the sour cream on top of it there. The sour cream will really flavor these fritters nicely once I put it on top of it, just like this. Isn't that great? The potato beignets of Magnolia Ridge Plantation. Now, what would I accompany all of this with? Well, I tell you, I found this wonderful carrot, mint, and honey recipe where you just boil the carrots and coat them with a little honey and mint, and they make a wonderful side dish for any of these things. And I tried it. You have to try this simple recipe. It's really, really nice. Now, I told you that my good buddy, Ann Goliath, was going to come and visit with me, and I hear her walking in right now. Hey, how are you doing? Hello, it smells so good. Man, doesn't it? How you, Hello. How's, that, how's everything at the plantation? Well, I think everything is just fine. Well, I made these really nice fritters here, and I'm going to move them off of the fire because I have a big skillet on my big platter already done. How do those look? Pretty good. Oh, huh? they look wonderful. Now, I want you to look at this gumbo here. This is the gumbo of, remember our... Good buddy we talked about? The, yes. The lady who turned her back on the general? Yes, I do. Huh? Let's... And I agree with her. <laughs> the North should never have won. Now, look at this. The chicken and sausage gumbo. We're going to put it all around Excellent. just like this. Isn't this nice? Mm -hmm. And, of course, you would serve that right in the bowl at the table. And this is about a serving for one good Cajun from Louisiana. Well, I would think so. Uh, and we can spice that up a little bit. Now, you promised that you are going to bring me some jelly, right? I did. I brought you something that I think you've probably never eaten before. And I'll bet you money you've never eaten before. Uh, it's called gummy jelly. Impossible. Gummy jelly, possible. Not gummy <laughs> jelly, gummy jelly. Gummy jelly. Tell yes. me about it. Well, gummy jelly is something that probably only folks who have visited Washington would ever know anything about. When I first came there, one of my neighbors across the street brought me a jar of gummy jelly and I didn't ask her how to spell it, which I do a lot of that because I'm a Texan. I don't <laughs> usually know what's really going on with the language. But she said, put it on your biscuits, and then, uh, you know, you won't care if you can spell it or not. So that's what I did, and it's wonderful. Yeah. I brought some to you. Well, what is it? Is it just a little uh, uh, wild berry of some kind? Well, it's, it, it grows on a bush, and I, when it's fully mature, it's rather tall, the bush is. And it's a kind of a, it looks like a cross between a shrunken cherry and a miniature plum. It's all pit. There's almost nothing there to eat, but it makes absolutely delicious jelly. Well, I tell you, I'm and gonna, wine. I'm going to try that on a biscuit or two. All La right. Last time I was at your place and sitting around that cypress swamp, I had a great bowl of mixed fruit. Remember that we had the big old platter yes, of mixed fruit yes. around there. I have, I love that recipe so much. I want to talk about it a little bit. Here you see that we have all of the ingredients that you told me I should use. Now all the different melons. Now you use. A lot well, of I think things. I think you can use a lot of uh, of different things, and of course, the fresher the fruit, probably the better the salad. And I'm using I'm all, I also mix seafoods with it, but you said that you could leave it out. But in here in South Louisiana, I love to add a little shrimp, crawfish, crab meat, all of those wonderful things to the salad. Let me show you what it looks like 
when it's all put together. This is exactly the way we had it on the, out of the, out of the little swamp that day. Isn't this a beautiful platterful? Now, it's I want beautiful. you to put Shall a little I bit. Shall I garnish it with a little bit of the yogurt dressing? The strawberry yogurt right on top of it. And then we could even put a couple pieces of that chopped mint. And this makes a mm, wonderful salad for a barbecue or out in the backyard or just as an entree. It's a fantastic salad. And I want to thank you for that great recipe. Well, Very simple. Hope you enjoy hey, pull it. up a seat here and let's talk a little bit about Magnolia Ridge. What a great place that is. Now, I know that you're from Texas. Mm -hmm. Your husband and yourself came from Texas. Uh, why, why the fascination with Louisiana plantations? Why did you have to renovate one? Well, I think it all started when I was learning to read. Uh, I was a little girl in North Louisiana, staying with my grandmother during the summer. She belonged to a book club. And um, the, the most famous romantic novelist of the time was named Frank Yerby. All of his books were exactly the same. They always had a very shapely heroine and a very muscular hero and a lot of white columns in the background and Mississippi mud. Right. So I think uh, just learning to read is where I became fascinated with, with the South and, and all of that. Now, now, you told me, though, that when you came to Louisiana looking for a plantation, you rode around for about five years, and you actually wanted one that you could save from the ground up, one that That's was right. just about gone, right? Yeah. Yeah, I really would have preferred to have something that, that I resurrected from the ashes myself. We weren't able to find such a thing, but we did look at uh, oh, probably 50 of those houses, and I think that looking was half the fun. Now, the gardens, you have 60 acres of manicured gardens there. Uh, were gardens in the plants from the beginning, or is that something that just evolved? Well, we haven't had any plans at all. Everything has just happened like Topsy. Uh, uh, we didn't have an idea to resurrect the gardens. We didn't have an idea to do anything in particular, but I did come across from one of the family members a diary of Evelina Prescott, and she was the, uh, the, the longest inhabitant of the house. And one of the things that she talked about was the garden, and I thought, we have all this wonderful documentation. Why don't we plant some of those <laughs> old things? Why not, why not redo it? Now, uh, I, you had visited the home before you told me that you had just by accident had come yes, up Yes, I that did. Home. Uh, I don't know if this is karma or exactly what, but my mother and I were lost, which whenever we travel, my mother and I very frequently are lost. And <laughs> we were 30 miles from the interstate and, and thinking any second we were going to find it and came upon a place to ask uh, directions. It was after dark, and uh, I asked if I could use the telephone. I was invited in and, and treated very graciously. And uh, it was obvious that this was an old antebellum home, but trying to be polite, and since they were so nice to me, I didn't, didn't ask any of the history of the house. But uh, five years later, when I advertised in the classified, uh, one of the people who answered my ad was this man who had lent me the telephone, and I didn't realize it until I walked into the house and, and saw the inside of the house, because it had been nighttime and I didn't see the outside that I had been there before, so it sort of gives me cold chills, and I think it was meant to happen. <laughs> it had to be meant to happen. When did you come up with the idea of allowing the public, you restored this beautiful home, did the gardens, and did you just say one day, public, come on in and enjoy what we've well, done? Well, no, that, that was another one of those unplanned things that we're famous for. Um, my husband is a runner, and he put in several miles of asphalt running pads. And so uh, it seemed a shame for us just to enjoy it all by ourselves. So he's asked some of the neighbors, you know, come on out and walk if you want to or come run. And then they told their relatives and their neighbors and now people from New York and uh, San Francisco <laughs> and Canada and uh, Great Britain come out and visit. Well, it's, it's an absolutely spectacular setting for jogging past or just someone who wants to come on out alone and sit down and meditate a little while. It's a beautiful spot. What's the future there? What do you plan on doing? Well, I don't, I don't know. I think it'll just happen like everything else. There's no guarantees, but I hope it continues just like it is, uh, growing and giving everybody pleasure. Well, if it continues in the same vein that it's been going for the last 10 years, I guarantee you, you've got something that the public and especially the people of Louisiana will enjoy for a long time, and thank you for it. And I want to well, thank, thank you so you. much for coming today. I hope you like the gummy jelly. <laughs> I will. And thank you for coming to visit as we continue to talk about plantations and cook up more of these great tastes of Louisiana. Thank you. Let's take a look at that gummy jelly. Mm -hmm.
Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Bruce's Yams and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. Chef John Fosa's Plantation Celebrations, Recipes from Our Louisiana Mansions, is a full-color 335-page book containing food history, recipes, and over 150 photographs from these southern landmarks. For your copy, send a check or money order for $28.50 to Louisiana Public Broadcasting, 7860 and Selmo Lane, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70810. Or use your credit card by calling toll-free 1-800-973-7246.